and welcome to episode 3 of the Carl O'Connor podcast with Craig Lynch. Thank you very much for tuning in so far. We hope you enjoy. Don't forget to subscribe to all our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We hope you continue to enjoy the podcast. Here is episode number three with the one and only Oshin McConville. Oshin McConville, uh, welcome to the podcast. How are you? How, how's been things during the lockdown? How's family? Things are good, hey. Things are good, and thanks for getting me on because it lets me escape from them for an hour or so. Uh, things are good. Uh, I have nothing really to complain about. I, I could do with a haircut, but apart from that, um, things are good. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the I'm on the same. I think all three of us are on that are on that <laughs> boat. Um, any coaching with the with the two wee boys at home during the lockdown? Yeah, we've been just been playing away. Uh, I, I I know I've I've. Uh, I've talked about this uh, on numerous occasions, but uh, what I used to do with the two boys, we used to go out and I used to let them beat me 10 9 all the time. <laughs> and uh, what I decided to do one day was just test uh, test a theory out that I had. <clears throat> and I hammered them then for about three or four days in a row 10 uh, 1 and 10 2. And uh, the next day, I got up, two boys were dressed outside practicing how they were going to beat me next day and I thought I should have fucking done that years ago <laughs> because uh just shows you though just shows you you know like li- little uh little things like that just test or uh test or resolve and uh so we've been kicking it it's great because the, the boys have m- a multitude of different interests and uh sometimes the weather's not great if the weather's not great they watch football uh, if it is good, we play football. <laughs> uh, we have we play a bit of pool, we play a bit of darts, but it all sort of revolves around football. Um, obviously, homeschooling gets in the way now and again, but uh, look at you know, as I say, I personally don't feel I have, I have too much to complain about. I just try and get on. We're trying to get on with it and trying to be as positive as we can, like you know, which it isn't easy at times. I know that, and people. There's a lot of people out there who are struggling, and and I notice the kids, you know, struggling from time to time, but. Just try and do something different, try and lift the spirits and try and get on with it. Yeah, and, and just on that, um we said the, the kids some of the kids might be finding it tough. Um I seen recently that there's been a lot of high profile sports people, uh especially in the north of the country, calling for uh so I suppose grassroots sports to, to um be opened again for the for the children. Would uh, would that be something that you'd be uh, you know in agreement with? Yeah, like I I did an article last week and one part of it was, you know, I felt we were shortchanged when it comes to elite status. Um, but to be honest, whenever we got that letter uh, last Wednesday week, um, that wasn't my major concern. My major concern is that nobody at top level was sitting down and saying, you know, we need to get kids back on the pitch. And the fact that that's not even in the psyche I, I personally, I, I just, I just don't understand that. And I, I, I know people say, well, that's because you have kids and, and and that sort of thing. But I think any logical thinking person will realize that we did six months of uh, kids on a on a pitch, uh, worldwide, uh, no known cases of of the spread of the virus outside, and just just makes sense to get kids back on the pitch and. It's, it's usually frustrating. They're missing out. They're missing out in school. They're missing out in interaction, social interaction, and, and they're missing out in the sport. And I put all those things together. Like, I mean, why wouldn't kids be struggling? Yeah, and obviously the line of work myself and Craig are in. Dude, we we work with kids a lot uh, through schools and clubs, and you know it, we're starting to do online sessions now. Uh, you know, from our from our kitchen with, with kids all over the the, the county here and. Um, you know, it's it's definitely not the same, and and obviously during the summer the cool camps went ahead, uh, which myself and Craig would have been involved in, and and you know they went off without a hitch, and I think um, I think people like you said, Oshin, are, are forgetting about the kids and forgetting about that, you know, the long lasting effect that it's going to have on, on on this generation possibly if we if we don't get them back on 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 the grass, um, for sure. Um, so we'll we'll move on if you don't mind. Um, 
I can't have you on, Oshin, what I, and I'm sure you spoke about this a lot, but uh, I think, you know, the three of us um, know each other from from working together in, in, in DKIT, and it's not often we get down to, to sit down and have a conversation uh, purely about football and, and things. Not a, seri- not a serious one, anyhow. No, no, it's it's usually you slagging me or, or slagging <laughs> Craig, so... Um, you, can we talk later on now at some stage about Oshin accusing me of cheating on the golf course? So I need to get this off my chest. We'll, we'll, we'll put that on the record at the end, right. Craig. But I don't think you. Good. I don't think you want to go there, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oshin, um, it's no, it's no secret uh, of of the, the the great career you had as a footballer, and and um, that all stems from from the club. Uh, you know, every single player that plays our sport and plays our game, uh, you know, it starts at the club. So, nice easy question. Uh, first off. What was what was it like growing up in your house in regards to the, the Gaelic football? Um, you know, I know your 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 family steeped in cross. Um, you know, so what was it like? What was your what's your earliest memories of of football? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have I don't have huge memories of being really really young uh, at home. Uh, I felt that at the time I was growing up in a in a in a, an area that was quite normal. And it was only when I got to maybe uh, ten or eleven years of age, I realised growing up and in, in in the way we were growing up in the midst of the troubles and all that sort of thing was not normal at all. In fact, it was it was quite abnormal. And I suppose f- football and sport and the club give us an opportunity to uh, express ourselves in a different way. Uh, any of the like I, I remember vividly sitting around the you know the kitchen table and every day when the news come on it would be you know there was a bombing or a shooting or a killing and you know and in, in Cross Midland even though if, if if it was anywhere close it was always said it was Cross Midland and uh, and I I remember you know feeling <clears throat> you know even when I went to secondary school that there was some sort of stigma around that and uh, <clears throat> I suppose when I was growing up. Uh, Cross were known as a very, very, it's hard to say, probably a very successful club back in the 60s and 70s. We won one championship in the 80s and one in the 90s, so you couldn't say we were, uh, oh sorry, won uh, two championships in the 80s. Uh, So you couldn't say we were really pulling up threes whenever you you, you think of it in that regard. But uh, I remember just being at home and, all of the focus was around as much as my mum tried to, you know, focus our minds on on schooling and and uh, and academics and all that sort of thing. Uh, the focus was very much around GAA. Uh, the mood on a Monday or through the week was determined by how Cross did at the weekend. Uh, Ama were really a non-entity at that stage. You know, we had spent you know we eighteen years without even winning that. Uh, an Ulster title that was up to 99. So Armagh wasn't really on the radar. I had a brother to play with Armagh, um, Jim, and we would have followed Armagh everywhere, but we followed them for a crack. We didn't really follow them for any, you know, <laughs> thinking there was going to be any major success or there was going to be a bandwagon to jump on at any stage. Uh, we followed them because, you know, he was playing and obviously local guys were playing and we had a an obvious avid interest in that. But uh g in my house was it was scary uh you know it was it was uh it was something just that just consumed consumed us uh consumed us as a family and the people around us uh you know our friends were g a related you know when we went to school you know it was the teachers were you know mums of players or you know fathers of players or you know were steeped in the in the club. So there was really no escape in it, to be honest. Uh, I, I I always remember not being that bothered about it until I actually got a ball in my hand at whatever age that was, three or four years of age, whenever I, you know, I used to, I would be well known, you know, at the time in cross for at five years of age, talking out for the under 10s, because that, that was the only team you could play. And there, was no one, there was no nursery, no under six, no under eights. So the first team you could play for was under 10s. And I think I run up and down the sideline after the manager looking for a game for about three years. 
uh, and eventually, do that. <laughs> <laughs> I eventually got some sort of taste of football. And once I once I got that, then I was off and and, and running, and, and I I loved everything about it. I we had a brilliant coach, a guy called Tim Gregory, who who took us through. Tim was actually he was seventy yesterday. I just seen a post going up about him yesterday. Uh, him being seventy, but like he took us at under 10, 12, 14, 16. He was literally in the field every single day of the week, and uh, he sort of taught us our trade. But I, I always go back to Tim Gregory. You know when, I, when people are talking about coaching and all? Mm. We were never overcoached. Do you know what I mean? We were A lot of it was to do with the freedom to express yourself and to be able to play. And when it got to a certain age or if there was something that needed to be corrected, then you did that. <clears throat> he did. He did multiple sessions where you're only allowed to use your week of foot and all that sort of thing, and that's sort of what molded uh, a good group of of players together that went on to win all. I think ten or eleven, eleven from a community games team that that ended up uh, going on to win thing. But we we were we. I suppose I don't want this to sound as if. You know, it's boastful or anything, but we were a team of winners because we just had a brilliant bunch of lads that came around at the one time. And yes, there was drop off, and that gay would leave one year, and and you know we we would be missing somebody like my my mom would always say to me like you know some of the players that stopped playing after after well not after primary school but maybe after on the fourteen or sixteen were way better players than I was and. Like we, I have videos. I can look back and I can look at lads, you know, at at underage level, twelves and fourteens, and they were doing st- some of the stuff, you know, little flicks and different things like that, and and just uh, it was obvious that they were given, as I say, the the freedom to just express themselves when they play football. There was no, you know, there was no particular uh, rationale a lot of times of what we were doing, and and I suppose then that started to come in at under sixteen and minor and. And we were able to progress from there. But if you're asking me what it was like to grow up in the house that I grew up in, it was it was completely football orientated. Uh, there was there was a big crowd of us in the house. You know, uh, I have three brothers and three sisters. Uh, I lost two brothers along the way, unfortunately. But there was a huge uh, there was a huge family. We lived in a three bedroom uh, end of terrace house, and uh, you know we. We there was no escaping each other, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, you know, if we if we if you didn't like football in our house, you were bother. So even the girls, like the girls, would be uh, the girls were you know fanatical uh, GA fans, and and the boys obviously all played there. There was enough for a three v three and a referee at the back. <laughs> uh, so there's no. It's you know you talk about Oshin there that. You know, GA was kind of everything. You know, to the area growing up, and and that for for everything that was happening around the Cross McGlen area at the time. But something that I found out, uh, I I thought was, you know, I found out years ago, and I thought it was really weird that there was there's there's no soccer club close to Cross McGlen. Um, that that's right. Well, there was a there was a uh. uh... A team that played out of a pub and cross uh, called Cartwheel uh, United, and they sort of were, you know, it very much a social thing. Some of the GA boys w- might have played a little bit in the off season. Uh, they were uh, founded, disbanded, founded, disbanded, and and sort of that's sort of the way uh, they went on. But they, they were they were ne- it was never really an issue around, you know, boys playing soccer and playing you know, playing Gaelic. But even from the underage side of things, so you know, you look at the clubs you have in the dock. I think uh, be right in saying your your lads play football and soccer in the dock. Yeah, the two boys are uh, they play with key, so like the, uh, that's and that's why because there's there is no there's no soccer club in in the town, especially not for for underage. So like soccer was not a, a thing we experienced when we were when we were growing up, uh, apart from watching on telly. And the and the other thing was that. No rugby, there was no hurling. We didn't have a gym, swimming pool, no athletics club. You know, I mean, we it literally was Gaelic football or else 
you know. And, and you think that that obviously played I- I into your favour that there was no other, I suppose, uh, amenities like that around. Yeah, I think absolutely everything focused around what was going on in the football pitch. Uh, you know, and you know we had we had one football pitch for a long time. Then we we added to it with a pitch behind uh, behind the main pitch, uh, and just you know it, it just participation just kept snowballing. Uh, participation now in our club will be probably at an all time high. I mean, I can't think of of too many families who don't have somebody involved. Uh, at some level, um, so I think that stands to you whenever you don't have other distractions. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of kids now who go, uh, like my own, who go to the dock or Newry or whatever to play a bit of soccer and stuff. But um, and that, so that that has changed. That's something that's changed dramatically. But other than that, um, you know, there's no major distractions, and wasn't any major major distractions, and definitely that stood to us, and definitely that was part of the reason why we. We were we ended up where we were. So just coming on to that now, um, I know yourself personally. You have, I hope my 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 figures are right. Um, That'll be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you let definitely let me know if they're not anyway. Uh, Sixteen club championships in Armagh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ten ten, else, uh, ten, ten Ulster clubs and six All Ireland clubs. Yeah. So you're not the only player obviously in in the cross mcglen set up to, to have won uh you know all of those trophies uh, a lot of that, a lot of those lads that you spoke about there that grew up with you have 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 won the same maybe some more um and i think you said a wee while ago, a wee while ago at the start of the conversation that it just happened to be a good bunch of guys coming together at the exact same time Okay, and that and that's grand, and I'm and I'm sure I'm sure it was, but surely there has to be something more to it than just you know good footballers coming together. Um, you know, a small little tight knit community that crosses that all you guys grew up together. Um, you know, was there a sense of just you know we do whatever we can for each other on the football field. We don't miss training. You know, we always want to try and better ourselves. Was that the mentality of that group? You know, I suppose during the 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 nineties and noughties. Um, just to go back on as as anybody got more uh, trophies than that. Uh, Paul Herty has must have uh, seventeen or eighteen county titles. But I suppose the big thing is he's a goalkeeper, and that doesn't really count. So uh, <laughs> just to but. When you say when you say about about boys coming together, yes, there was boys coming together, and we all went into that senior setup in and around the same time. But we didn't have instant success. We had three years of absolute hell. I mean, my first two years, like if anybody was writing a horror movie, like the like we we went uh, my first year in the in the panel, we took a left footed free taker off. I was sixteen years of age. Took me on. Ended up getting a free in the last minute to equalise the game. I took it from the wrong side of the pitch because nobody, everybody has run away from it, and uh, and I missed it. The next year, uh, we played Pierce Oak, still winning ten 0 after about six minutes of the game, and we clawed our way back into the game. We got a penalty in the last minute. Uh, I was seventeen. I ended up taking it, missed it. Uh, we were beaten. Uh, come back the following year. Uh, BBC did a documentary. Uh, called More Than a Game, and it was ourselves in Mullaban. I was talking about uh, parish rivalry and all that sort of thing, and uh, we ended up um, we ended up getting beat, and we ended up getting beat with the nation to have a good look back on it and, and see where we went wrong. Things just weren't right in that dressing room at that time. Uh, Tony and John McIntyre came along and and. I remember at one particular meeting shaking things up a little bit about, you know, you were talking about boys willing to do whatever it took. There were some boys maybe in the dressing room who weren't. And uh, after that meeting, they, uh, they left. And I would have huge respect for those lads because they realised they weren't going to be able to give what everybody else was given. Uh, Joe Kernan had already got three years done at that stage. Uh, and luckily enough, he stayed on for another year. And the following year, we went on one all Ireland. And... Um, that was a change. So, like when I say about, I'm not blasé, but the fact that we good lads came along at the one time, good lads came along at the one time, and then we started to uh, uh, realize that we needed to work. 
because we've been used to winning. We won everything, you know, all the way up, and we've been used to winning. We just took it for granted. Walk into the senior team and we were winning into, uh, winning uh, county championships. Never mind Ulsters or all Ireland. We just we thought we'd be in winning uh, county championships, and that didn't happen. We watched Muller Band the year before. After that, uh, after that documentary, go to an All Ireland semi final, and we're beaten. <clears throat> and we were all at that game, and um, we realised like at that stage that the penny had dropped, and we were going to have to do something seriously. And as I say. There were some sacrificial lambs at that stage, some lads who maybe, whether it be through work commitments or family commitments or whatever it was, um, had to walk away from the, from, from the panel because they weren't going to be able to give the three or four nights a week that we had stepped it up to. And, uh, and then once we started that, you know, we won our first round of the challenge of that year against a second division team in Armagh by a point. Uh, and... We had cha- completely changed the way we played football, completely changed the style of play. And uh, and after that first round of the championship, it started to click for us. And we started to get a bit of momentum, and it goes from there. Easily, honestly, lads, easily. It could have went completely the other way. You know, history history is uh, has a crazy way of rewriting itself. And, like... I just think, like, if we had been beaten by that second division team um, in the first round of the championship, chances are Joe would have been gone out of management. Uh, you know, we would have new management. And, you know, as I say, you just don't know what could happen. So there's a, there was a lot of luck involved in, in what we ended up doing. But once we got there and we started to be successful, uh, we, we we liked that. We liked, the, 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 um, we liked winning things and we liked the fact that we were doing it together, and w- by God, had we got a, did we have a great time while doing it? You know, I could tell you, I could tell you, lads, at that time, and I know it's a completely different game, but after every championship match, we used to go out on a on a Sunday night after a game. We used to meet Monday, uh, and we used to go out all day Monday, and we used to train on the Tuesday. We used to do a thing called Terrible Tuesdays, <laughs> and uh, Terrible Tuesdays was a thing that Jerry Francis. Uh, had invented for the Spores soccer team. We had a guy called Donald McKenna with us, who was a selector, mad Spores fan. Uh, had researched this. Well, when I say he researched it, he'd seen it. He'd seen a clip of it, and so we got uh, a version of what Jerry Francis did. But I, I it only took it took me about fifteen years to realize that Jerry Francis' terrible choosers were uh, involved about half the amount of running that we were doing. But <laughs> At that time, we were willing to accept it. You were just willing to do anything because we, we wanted success. And as I say, we enjoyed ourselves. Uh, it was unique and nothing better than, than that for building uh, morale. You know when people talk about, let's go away for a weekend before, I think. Yeah. Let's do a bit of hard work and then go away for a weekend. I'll do a bit of hard work and then put that alongside that because marry those two things together. It's it's unbelievable what, what it can do for a team regardless of of uh, of whether you've had a, a history of winning or not. Spring and back, Oshin, to the, the bit you said there about, you know, potentially you had a small bit of luck uh, in, re- in regards to, you know, beating that team um, and then going on to, to winning championship, etc., etc. All-Ireland, all Joe stayed on. After, after that season, after, like you said, that winning feeling that you've got, did, did it just take like did you feel that it just take uh, it took over itself that everything then was like you know you no know, just not trying to say it wasn't Joe Karen and if it was any manager there it doesn't matter who it was that because you know the majority of that group of players had that feeling like that feeling and, and knew what it what it took to get there that it just took on a, a, a world of its own like yeah totally I think Joe put everything in place that we needed to facilitate us. Uh, you know, we had John McCluskey in, you know, he came from uh, an Ulster rugby uh, background and, you know, here he was in cross, you know, helping us, you know, trying to win. So I suppose people seen that, we seen, you know, we were getting the, the, the things the players love getting, we were getting the gear, the boots, we were getting the, all of those things, uh, the food after training, we were... You know, and like that's back in the, you know, that's back in the, the like in the mid late nineties. Um, and he put all of those things, and then from that point, from that point on, the change room sort of run itself. 
you know, boys were uh, like if, if anybody stepped out of line, it was to be honest, it wasn't really Joe. It was it was uh, the individuals in the team. I remember on one occasion being called aside, you know, before training because of a slight misdemeanor at the weekend, and it was the players who were dealing dealing with me. And like I, you know, went on and I would have dealt with players after that with, you know, with stuff that was going on, you know, behind the scenes and different things. So we were very much accountable to each other then. And once we created that accountability with each other, uh, then nothing really had to be said. You know, there was an odd time, you know, we'd have to be a bit of a, a meeting like most teams would have maybe halfway through the season just to make sure that standards were were kept up. But um Normally speaking, you know, things sort of run quite smoothly and more or less looked after themselves. Uh, whoever was the captain would have had a say in, you know, what way we prepared for games, as in when we were in Alta, into the Ulster Championship or into the All-Ireland Series. Some people like staying over, some people don't. Some people like sleeping in their own beds, some people don't. So simple things like that, you know, we would have had a say in. But otherwise, Joe just put all the things in place and and uh, give us the opportunity to go and play and along with that you know i suppose one thing we would have seen as well from uh joe's time was that he wasn't afraid to bring other people in you know we had colm rock sean boyle and mark McHugh. we had uh you know we we had paddy tally we had you know we had loads of gays who come in and did different sessions and different themes on on different things that were going wrong at different times and all that sort of thing so uh, you know, once you see that and you see a manager is bigger than just, you know, his own ideas or, you know, that, that he doesn't think he knows it all and all that sort of thing, it definitely helps and players definitely buy into it, you know? Yeah, definitely. And and you hear a lot of people now speak about how they want their clubs or they want their teams, uh, whether it be, you know, rugby, soccer, Gaelic, Hurling, uh, player driven, the you want know, everything player driven, and you're kind of the coach or manager is kind of facilitating everything, and the players are driving everything, and that's basically what you just described there, and 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 you know that that theory is 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 in place a long time, but even you know it's just now recently over the last year or two that you hear people talking about that player driven environment that they're they're trying to bring to their to their team, and you know you guys are proof, proof that it, it it obviously works, you know, in some capacity. Um, so 2002, Oshin. I'm not going to talk about any other any other year other than 2002, and just asking you, uh, what's your memories of that whole year of that season? Well, if I can just if I can just go from 2001, we've been beaten by <clears throat> we've been beaten by the eventual All Ireland champions for the previous three seasons uh, by a point. And uh, we went into 2002. Obviously, uh, Joe had come in, Paul Grimley had come in. <clears throat> there had been one or two additions to the panel, but mainly, largely speaking, we were the same. Joe had talked to talk Francie into uh, joining the panel. Uh, anybody who doesn't know the story about <clears throat> Francie joining the panel, Joe rang Francie and said, Francie, will you, will you come to training? And uh, you know, I want you to be part of the arm. I said, uh, We're training Tuesday night. Will I collect you? No, 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 Joe, you're grand. I'll, I'll, I'll see you down there. Francie never, tu- never turned up. Thursday night comes. Uh, <clears throat> Francie, you didn't show up. No, I was working late. Uh, well, I, uh, well, I collected for Thursday night. No, no, Joe, honestly, I'll be, I'll be down myself. Francie doesn't turn up. <clears throat> um, on the following Tuesday night, uh, Joe was, I think, was sitting at his house from about a quarter to six, waiting for him to come in the door from work. No dinner. Straight into the, uh, grabs his stuff straight into the car. Uh, the first night, the first night we were doing tackling grids and uh, Just McNulty um, clotheslined them and put, <laughs> and put them on the, put them on the ground. Uh, I could see the steam coming from Francie's ears, but Francie didn't do anything. He just got up and, and got on with it, and uh, he muttered under his breath as, as he went past me. It might take me a while, but I'll get him back. <laughs> I think it I think it took him about four years to get him back, but. He was probably one major addition to the panel that gave us a bit of extra, uh, just a bit of extra steel and something that <clears throat> maybe we didn't have at that stage at the back. And, and you know, players, I think, sort of learned off him, even though he wasn't one for uh, for talking or, or voicing his opinion. 
they just, he just he just sort of led by example. So that was a major asset. But once Joe came in, uh, we'd gone through that league. We were in Division Two that year. Uh, we were beaten by Leash in, a, in the league semi final. Um, we nobody seen that Pretoria, but we were we were well beaten. We were well beaten, even though I like I don't actually know the scoreline. I think they might have won by four or five points, but it felt like a, a bit of a hammering. But like we were we were training like we were training like madmen at that at that stage. Like you know that we were tra- it didn't matter what league game it was. We were our training was geared towards what was going to happen in the championship. Then we were told we were going to La Manga for preseason, uh, and everybody in the change rooms to a mat. Well. Apart from Giza, maybe start rubbing our hands, going nice one, and uh, you know, whenever you're packing your bag, you just think this is going to be the same arm as before. So you stick in a nice, your nice shirt, and you stick in a nice pair of jeans <laughs> and uh, a nice pair of shoes because you think, like we're in the manga for six days, we definitely will get out one night. Um, the jeans and the shirt never got it, never seen the way out of the bag, but. It, there was something different about it. As soon as we, you know, we got onto the bus, we were given our itinerary, we were given everything what was going to happen in the next six days. And you think, there's no way. You look at the itinerary, you go, there's no way that we can fulfill all that. And we did it to the letter of the law. Every single thing that was on that itinerary, two sessions some days, three sessions another day, one session, three sessions, two sessions. Uh, we had a, D, a guy called Dave Alred who came in that time, who was working with free takers, a guy who's worked with, who worked with Johnny Wilkins initially. He works with a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of golf, uh, uh, golfers at the minute. Uh, Craig, maybe he could do you something for your game as well. <laughs> um, but he came in and he was, he was, uh, like he was, he was big news at that stage and uh, he was taking videos in the evening after the three sessions we would go to him he'd break down your free kicks for you tell you what you were doing wrong what you were doing right what you need to replicate uh and so it was it was massively full on i just was your phone from- no she now was your phone huge benefit from working with him like i've um watched documentaries and stuff from that fella like and he is top of the range but would you have really found benefit from him being there the only benefit i i found from personally was routine yeah uh, i had sort of i had sort of changed up my routine a little bit uh like he would be the first to say like that you know kick, teaching somebody to kick you know rugby ball and teaching somebody to kick a, a free kick is completely different but when you break it down there's lots of different things there's a visualization stuff uh which he had started with us at that stage but also the main thing for me as i say was routine sticking to that routine over and over and over again but in order to stick to routine you have to be happy with that routine yeah so it takes a lot of practice to get to be happy with that routine and once we were happy then we were as i say we could go ahead uh we used to the way we used to take free kicks was we used to go out onto the field throw 20 balls down and take them from x y and z he give us uh Nine areas on the field that he wanted us to take free kicks from because he'd looked at GA, he'd looked at at in particular myself and Paddy McKeever's free kicks from the previous three years and the areas of the pitch which we ended up taking free kicks. So he had he had uh, as I say he had nine zones in the field that that he wanted us to kick from, and we started to do that and it involved ten free kicks. So every time we did on the pitch. Uh, after training, he wanted us to take ten free kicks, and and uh, and that sort of worked because it means you can take ten quality free kicks rather than taking thirty half hours ones. And the ten is a very good number because I know how many I got tonight, how many I get tomorrow night, and then you're trying to create a consistency where you're at nine out of ten all the time. And that was the point. He never said ten out of ten, never said ten out of ten once. He said, "Get the nine out of ten, lads." And, uh, you would have kicked the majority out of your hands, wouldn't you? I was oh, kicking yeah. them off the. I was kicking them off the ground at that time until 2003, and I got a bit of a back injury, and then I started uh, kicking them out of my hands. But the good thing was at that stage that you know instead of getting flustered about kicking out of my hands, I just went back to his stuff and just you know uh, took all that stuff on board, as in practice what I was happy with, uh, and then 
just take it on from there. And even even though I tweaked it, I suppose at different stages, uh, the basis for what he was giving us sort of stayed the same, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, his book is very good. Like I, I know the Southland folks and lads with kickouts. It's very hard to break it down because it's, everyone's different. But he would have sp- spoke a lot about, would say, the style of a, a C style kick and a J style kick. And I suppose when I'm watching people take free kicks, that's what's in my head. The likes of Sam would say has changed, and he's a very straight run up. So the 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 line his foot follows would be the shape of a J compared to like the David Beckham round style C like so it does break down. It's just interesting. I didn't know you were working with him, but um yeah he's very well spoke of. Yeah, I know he, he's brilliant. Just you were talking about the C and the J. He used to talk about he used to talk about that, but he also used to talk about the top pocket. And uh it's the top pocket is about when it leaves your foot and you feel I don't even have to look at the post to know it's over. You know that's so, you know when you yeah. when you connect when you connect with something and uh, he actually did that with the whole team uh he did we did uh different kicks and I, I that's something that that i really liked as well because i felt that instead of three or four of us learning from him that the whole squad could have learned of him, you know for because i think even when you're looking at free kicks you can take the free kick part into uh kicking from normal play as well because you just you're just breaking it down a little bit and you just remember and the key uh points at the end of the kick i suppose yeah yeah so anyway, the the gear didn't come out of Le Mans, uh, out of Le Mans. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uh, 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 the the gear didn't come out, and we and we trained like mad. This is the truth, lads. When we when we drove in, <clears throat> when we drove into uh, the the place we were staying in, Real Madrid were on a bus driving out, and when we got our uh, when we got the first meal we got was a lunch. And at the top of the page, it said, uh, you know, uh, menu for Real Madrid. And uh, and obviously that changed the arm for the following day. But, you know, you know, we were in the same uh, apartments. We had the same uh, nutritional stuff we had. Uh, we were using the same gym. We were using the, all the same things as they've been using. And uh, we felt... Honestly, we felt like professional. We felt for those block of days, we f- you felt like a professional athlete. You felt as if you know we're in a structure where, to be honest, a lot of pressure was on because you felt you were in a structure that it was going to be very, very difficult to difficult to if you did fail, having uh, uh, the, considering what people had put into getting us out there and putting all those things in place for us. So. Um, you know, fast forward from that, we played Tyrone in the first round of the championship. We drew at them, beat them in a replay. And sort of, you know, after that, we sort of more or less took care of business until uh, we came up against the Dubs in, in the All-Iron semi-final. Uh, Rick Cosgrove missed a, a free raid at the end of the game. He hit the post. Come to, again, you know, you talk about luck in, in sport, come to, back down into Francie's hands, I think, or Justy's hands. And we we get a little bit up the field, and referee blows the whistle. So the whistle the post really, and then the All Ireland final, like you know, the All Ireland final. <laughs> the All Ireland final. We I don't I still don't think we played great. We give like when I look back on on uh, the All Ireland final, which I actually did at the start of the, uh, of the lockdown last uh, March, because I was doing a little bit with second captains on it, because I'd never watched the game back fully. I always watch bits and pieces, mainly my goal, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I never watched the full game through, so I wasn't really aware of sort of what happened. And I remember texting a few boys from the LMA squad uh, after I'd watched it going, Jesus, you were actually better than I thought you were. <laughs> uh, because I didn't think any of us really did that well that day, but we actually played some decent stuff. We'd given an awful lot of ball away, but again, you know, we were we were quite lucky in a lot of things that happened that day for us to get over the lane. So, I think, yeah, you spoke about how, uh, again, I'm just going to come back to some of the stuff you said there. So, again, luck, luck is something that, that you've mentioned a few times. Uh, so, obviously, that's something you feel it's really important in, in sport. You obviously need skill and, and, and everything else and good team environment, good, good players, <laughs> etc. But uh, luck is important. Would I be right in saying as well, you did you draw against Sligo that year also? True, against Sligo in the quarter final. Yeah, we played them in a replay in Navin. Yeah. So that's two draws. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
get a bit of luck against the uh, win the two replays, get a bit of luck against the dubs that Ray Cosgrove missing that free. I actually watched that this morning, you know, and, and it was literally how you described it. I think there was one hand pass, maybe two hand passes after he's got the ball back and the ref blew the whistle. And then... You watched that this morning? You need to get out more. <laughs> I'm, I'm walking from home. Uh, I'm walking from home. Um, so then, then obviously you, you've carry in the final and... Things things don't go to plan. Um, you know, you go in losing by three or four points at half time. Uh, come out, come out late. Uh, leaving Kerry waiting. Um, coming out at half time was that something that you know was was it Joe in the dressing room at half time actually you know giving that big speech or was there the speech done and over and it was a little mind games as in you know fucking. Leave them waiting, you know. We leave them sweating for a wee bit, and we come out. Or, or was they're, they're, they're talking on like? Uh, no, I genuinely think that that was like we, we didn't even wait, leave them waiting that long. Uh, but I didn't really hear much of the speech. I missed the penalty in the first half, and I was sort of. Well, in a don't worry, war- don't worry. I'm, I'm coming back. To that. <laughs> uh, I was sort of in a little world of my own, worrying about poor uh for the majority of that uh, half time. Uh, Joe made the speech and we went out on the pitch. We had a sports psychologist, two sports psychologists with us. Well, I think you, you probably know one of Des Jennings, who's been up at the college a couple of times. Uh, and Des had come to me and he said, listen, when you're going out onto the field in the second half, bring a ball with you, stick it in the roof of the net at the hill and uh, and, and it, you just forget about the penalty, basically. And I thought about it and I thought, if I do that, I'm going to look like that. I'm going to look like some fucking idiot. So instead of that, I took the ball out of me and just booted the ball as far as I could into the stand uh, and uh, run up and, and, and took my position. But I don't remember a huge amount about, about half time. Don't remember too many people coming over to me or anything else. I think they were happy to leave me alone. Uh, but Joe's speech obviously struck a chord with a lot of people. Um, and I suppose. You know, we would have felt we let ourselves down big time in the first half. Uh, I suppose the, the problem we had was that we weren't sure as if we were going to have the wherewithal to get back into the game. Uh, I think we were five points down at, at, at half time. I don't, wasn't sure if we would have, you know, the wherewithal to, to get back into the game considering they had a, they were very good, brilliant forwards, very good in the middle of the field. And they didn't give away a lot of the back, but... Um, just things conspired, and we and we uh, we got ourselves back into the game. Once the goal went in, then they only really looked like one winner at that stage, you know. And then Stevie got one, and no, Clarkie got one, and Stevie got one to get us over the line. Who were you marking that day, Oshin? Tomas uh, was uh, was on me, and uh, I've been very much warned about the fact that he loved going forward. Uh, he, he, I think he had one run forward that day. Lucky enough for me. Uh, but uh, he, he, I think he, he definitely had the better of me for 40 minutes of the game. Fantastic player, wasn't he? Good player, yeah. Brilliant player. Oh, Shane, you spoke about breaking onto that cross team, uh, you know, missing a penalty, missing a free kick, um, you know, and you miss a penalty in an all-around final then probably was maybe six six years after after the first penalty miss. Um, like, in a weird way, do you think that 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 you know you said your first two years across? In a weird way, do you think that that has you know prepared you to bounce back from that as well subconsciously, maybe? Yeah, yeah, but it was it was very much subconscious at that stage because the penalty that penalty you know when I was seventeen was sort of very much in the back of me. You know, I can say that the history. Yeah, and uh, and I'd sort of moved on from that. But I think the the big thing about the the one in 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 Crow Park was that Armagh had only played in two All Ireland finals before, 1953 and 1977. We missed two penalties. We missed a penalty in each of those. Uh, there was a gay called Bill McCarry who missed a penalty in 1953. He had died, and the priest. The first thing the priest said at his funeral mass was, "This is the gay who missed the penalty in 1953." So. <laughs> You sort of feel as if I had an uncle played in that team, my mum's brother played in that team, so I'd grown up with the name Bill McCarry, and you know, it, you know, it was always there was always 
uh, you know, my mum always used to say this guy was an unbelievable player, unbelievable, but he'd be forever remembered as missing a penalty in all Ireland final. So uh, that that was in my conscious, believe it or not, as soon as I missed it, you know. So uh, that's not the sort of thoughts you want to have run through your head when you're playing against footballer. No, definitely not. And like you, you won the penalty, uh, you know, missed it. So I'm sure, like you said, you're fucking. Head to head is you probably don't know you know where to look, what to do. That seven or eight seconds then when you got that you know you got that pass, you went on that run, you finished into the bottom corner. Like, are you thinking about I have I have to score this here? I have to score this because of the penalty miss, or do you try to, or, or did everything just happen too quick? Nah, I just think it's it's autopilot then. Yeah, you know, I think I think because of, because of the way you missed the penalty and. The nerves have gone out the window. You sort of feel as if, like, when I went out in the second half, I just thought the best thing I can do is just probably just walk as hard as I can here and, and see does can anything happen for me. And that's the advice that I have given lads since I started playing with them at senior level when I started to get become one of the more senior players, lads. I just, I never say, lads, let's go out and score one six, one seven, two eight, whatever it is. I just say, lads, let's walk as hard as we can as a forward unit and Things just happen for you then. Do you know what I mean? If you're a good enough player, things just happen. And and uh, so it was autopilot. You know, when I got in there, it was just autopilot. And and to be honest, uh, he the keeper made made things a little bit easy for me. Like you know, he was he was always going the far side. Like so, give me an opportunity to sneak in the, the side. Like you know, Crouchy tell you about. It. I don't know if Crouchy's ever seen the goal, but Crouchy be able to tell you that. Um, like he should have been man in his he should have been man in his near post. Yeah. Like most goalkeepers will try and like as a player is coming run at him will try and think right where's he gonna go? Like so I'm sure I should probably open the body up a small bit. Like naturally you're thinking, right, he's gonna try and go across me because I have my front post covered. So then he starts to move and all of a sudden the, it opens up, you know. I've done it I've done it myself a few times trying to second guess it and it's it's a killer so it is when you get caught. Yeah, but he, it, there's a, like he might have been trying to make make me mind up for me, you know that's all uh, but mm. uh but he, he he didn't. I'd like to um I'd like to uh I'm a fan of the collar up, it was impressive. Was it Eric Cantona style? Was it was he was he a hero? Uh, I, I funny. I've been talking about this for the last couple of days because I've been doing a, a lot of stuff uh, around uh, mental health. Actually, uh, my job involves you know talking to like uh, youth teams and stuff like that. I was talking to Sunderland uh, youth team yesterday, and uh, never thinking that there would be anybody over there on the call that would know me. I can't see people's faces, uh, and this guy put up in the chat bar. Uh, what we do? Why? Why did you wear your collar up in nineteen ninety nine or whatever? And uh, I go sick. And uh, so, <laughs> to be honest, not I don't I don't think we want to go into this today, but that was me trying to portray an image. Do you know what I mean? Things weren't going great for me off the field, to say the least. But uh, and I was trying to portray an image of being cocky, arrogant. Uh, didn't care, but yeah, that's where the, uh, the inspiration was. Eric Cantona, as I always say, in 1989, two people wore the collar up, me and Eric Cantona. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was, uh, yeah, that was that was the deflect people's uh thoughts of, of who I was and, and what I was doing at that time. So, uh, there was, there was a lot of psychology went into that, even though I knew nothing about that word psychology at the time, yeah. So- Oisin, um again, just before we move off from, from this, uh, just to remind anyone or anyone who, who isn't old enough to remember 2002 that might be listening that, you know, Mr. Penley scored uh, probably the most, the most uh, important score of Alma's history in the game and one man in a match. So, again, it, it ended up being a very, very good day for you and, and, and obviously Alma. So, um away from the playing side now you know done a lot of coaching and managing so far you're you're um you know obviously coaching dkit now um for the last uh 100 years um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah feels, it feels longer <laughs> so yeah I had stints at, at obviously cross uh you're involved in a documentary 
Uh, it was recorded behind the scenes, which is very good. If if anyone hasn't seen it, I, I think it is available on YouTube. I think that's uh, what that uh, the Chicago Bulls one was based off. There wasn't the last dance <laughs> the motion across. Very <laughs> um, very very good good insight behind the scenes. Uh, uh, um, and then you know you, you, a stint then while you, still with with within a scheme um, in Monaghan there so. Again, a few other more clubs as well. Uh, Central Town you're involved with. And, uh, so coaching and managing is obviously something that you're passionate about, something you're interested in. Um, any any thoughts on, on becoming uh, an inter-county coach, inter-county manager, or you know, are you happy doing that bit of punditry with, with, with RTE and, and you know, everyone's seen you on the, the BBC for the championship as well during, during the summer? Um, <clears throat> I suppose I, I have aspirations to 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 go ahead and, and manage it at the county level. Um, it doesn't really, it's not really a good fit for me right now because you know I, I have young kids at home and it's going to involve a huge amount of time. I wait for the kids to get up a little bit, uh, and Fitzer didn't give me the shout uh, <laughs> before he get before he get on to Mickey Hart. Uh, I thought it was a shoe in up there and loud, but didn't even get a phone call. <laughs> um, but yeah, the county management is something I am interested in because I tell you, I tell you why I'm particularly interested in the county management is that uh, I like the uh, the thoughts of managing people and having enough supports around that. Like so, for example, when I when I coach with DKT, when I have been with Census Town Cross and uh, and Enniskeen, which despite what you say is only the only three clubs I've been with, uh, Carl. Uh, but I do the management and the coaching role, and uh, that in itself can be tough because. I, I I like the, the, as I say, uh, man management is something I'm very very interested in getting the best out of people, and I think that when you're coaching and managing, it's difficult. It's a very difficult job to do both of those things, and to see what's going on in front of your face. That uh, that I would very easily pick up on if I was to say walk in and do a a session with plans or uh martins or whatever you know I, I would i would pick up and stuff very very quickly um and so i think that's why it would be mainly interested in, in inter-county management is that uh, i'd be very much interested in yes doing a little bit of coaching while i'm there but also but mainly uh, having good people around me and then trying to work on players trying to make sure the players are in uh, a place where they're able to uh, give her the best, and I think if you, if I could, if I could go in and I would be able to marry those two things well, then yes, in the county management is something I'd definitely be interested in down the line. Well, she just on you, your your coaching style or management style. I was just listening to you earlier on. You mentioned was it Gregory for Cross McGlen? Tim, um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, his free play style of football. You know, let the player go out and express themselves. And then Joe Cairn with his, basically what you described there, where he would be basically putting all the building blocks in place for you guys to succeed. Like, that seems to me, watching you, is the style that you've taken in regards to seeing you at DKT and, and how the lads would say speak about you and how you speak to them, I suppose. Seems to be that free flow in football. Seems to be putting the building blocks in place. Like, which of the coaches have you taken I suppose, bits and pieces from. They're the only two you mentioned there today, but I'm sure you've had plenty of managers over your time. But which ones would you have taken most from? Believe it or not, I haven't had that many managers. I had, you know, Joe was with Cross for nine years and Ama for six or whatever it was. So, uh, you know, that's sort of, there's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of overlap there. So, um, Joe would probably be the main one. Uh, I had obviously different stints with, you know, uh, Brian McAniff was somebody who was really interested in as well because um, he, he wasn't massive on huge amounts of information, uh, especially for, uh, let's say, inside forward. Uh, you know, he, he, he liked the structure and he liked, uh, he, he, he was 
he was probably way ahead of his time as far as uh, uh, restarts, kickouts, you know, sailing balls, all that sort of thing. But uh, it, as far as forwards came, I mean, he more or less let them let them play. Uh, so I th- probably Joe uh, Bray McGniff would have learned a little bit off him and uh, Paul Grimley, who was along with uh, Joe in uh, in Armagh. Um, then there's a few other guys who would have been across who who uh like Gareth O'Neill and, and Tony were there at the end of my career and uh much more structured, uh much more probably attention to detail, uh, but also with that little bit of freedom. But then I suppose the, the way I, I would like to be is Craig is very much uh have a set of principles and try and stick to those principles as much as you can. Uh, while being aware that mistakes are going to be made along the way, and and I've made mistakes along the way, uh, you you boys have been there. What I've made a couple of them, but uh, my mistakes are, uh, are going to be made along the way. But uh, I suppose trying to learn from all of them and trying to bring them on to the next game or the next group of players you work with, uh, but mainly uh, trying to tick all the boxes as far as what. There's stuff in the GA now as far as uh, Gaelic football. There's there's must do's. There's things that you must do, even things that sometimes might feel alien from you as a coach. You just have to do them, and you have to have certain things in place. And and that's the way I work now. Have certain things in place, and then other than that, try and give players as much freedom as 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 is, as is humanly possible. And put a caveat on that: certain players don't need any freedom certain players shouldn't get any freedom certain players don't deserve any freedom uh cornerbacks in particular um <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but ser- but seriously there's, there's players who respond more who respond better to having like a job to do or or uh or more structure around the game and then there's other people who who don't respond well to that and it's it's spend a bit of time with people finding out what sort of characters they are and and, and making sure that you're not uh, mixing those two things up like giving somebody a job who who generally speaking probably not going to be able to do that that job or uh, doesn't want to do the job even more so and the, and uh, and also you know the thing around you know letting somebody play some play, players want to be told exactly what to do in exactly in every single situation and. It's just a matter of, that's something which which grows when it, with the more you spend time with players and that's the, f- the most fucking uh frustrating thing at the moment about you know the time wasted not being able to do that with individuals as much even as much as teams yeah no excellent ushing and <clears throat> some of the stuff that, that you know i suppose you're after you're after giving us there over the last that, that little last pieces been invaluable and even listening to the, the the part about speaking about having your principles and making sure that you stick to those principles as best as possible um you know it's something that definitely you know resonates with me and and something that i definitely agree with um so yeah i, I just want to i just want to i suppose before we finish up craig I, i'm going to break bring up um craig's cheating in golf but just, just before we go i, I just want to tell uh tell everyone story about um before before i even met you um i met your mom uh and i remember i went to a game in uh, it was cully hannah v cross in in, in 2017 uh, it was all in cully and and i think i might have told you this one before Oshin. um so lovely day great I'm standing over the pair of shorts the far side of the pitch watching the game sun out of the eyes and there was a wee bit of a uh, there was a wee bit of an argument between the car here and then the car to the left of me. So I was kind of in the middle of the argument. I was looking, I said, Jesus, and that, that woman is 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 giving them awful abuse. Like, so it was a cross car and a Cully Hanna car. Um, so you know, and I was like, Jesus, that's that's she's passionate about cross, you know. She and I'm not going to repeat some of the stuff she said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and. 
It was mad that, that, you know, I asked you to start all his life growing up in your house, uh, you know, when you said it was all football, all passionate. And, and again, you didn't you didn't mention your mom, really. But, uh, you know, you seen that documentary that she's down making the tea, down making the sandwich, the sandwiches that she, you know, she just loved, loved the club probably even more than you did. And it was only then I watched the documentary after that. He says, fuck me, that's how Shima Convo's mother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that must be all laughing. You, know, you weren't even playing. I know you had no relations even. I'm not even sure even Reen was playing. Uh, or even his, probably his brother was playing maybe at the time. But um, it was uh, it was very whatever, funny. Whatever she was saying, whatever she was saying, the Cullianos is well deserved. <laughs> uh, oh, that was that was great, and a good laugh when I. Uh, no, when I, but my 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 mum rounded a lot of uh, a lot of everything in my life, but in particular the, the football stuff. Uh, we have a brilliant video of we played in a in a schools Ulster schools final when we were still primary school. Uh, we were playing against actually some of the boys who actually went on to play with Throne, but. Uh, my mum was literally, she's about 20 yards off the sideline, onto the pitch, running up and down, encouraging people. Uh, you can see our half-time oranges, water, the whole walk. So, uh, you know, she's been a, she's been there every sort of step of the way. And, and uh, she's just, she just loves, she just loves football. And, and, you know, her passion comes out and that's the way uh, she's able to express it, which is, I think is brilliant. Yeah, no doubt. The women back then were a different breed, weren't they? I know my granny was the same. My granny um, Lynch, that she used to, she'd be in the sideline for a game, and if you hear her shouting, <laughs> like I've been on the pitch and I've heard opposition players saying, uh, "Who the fuck is your one beside you, giving her a stick?" You know, and I'd have be head down, but someone might respond and bick her back, you know, and she'd have, she'd have put the umbrella down and she'd start walking on. She'd only be. <laughs> She's only five foot, you know, and she'd be coming and I'd be going, oh, Jesus Christ, she's going to kill someone. She's going to kill someone. But the passion was just, it was unbelievable, you know. Uh, lads, I, uh, this is no lie. I've been in Clonus and Crow Park with 30, 40, 80,000 people and I can still pick a voice out. Oshin, <laughs> <laughs> um, you've been very, very good with your time. Uh, really, really appreciate you coming on and having a chat with us. Um, so basically, you... basically, Carl, what happened was he went over into the rough <laughs> and he obviously had three or four golf balls in his pocket and next thing we see him dropping one down say, and shouting I found it I mean I, I'll like, I, the I mean like, if, there, if there is if there is uh, any question marks around whether he cheated or not I think that's probably self-explanatory at this stage started with a slashinger ended up with a Nike one of those jobs <laughs> We were on the ninth hole, Carl, in Seapoint, and it was a competition, Oshin and Shane versus myself and Derek. Now, for anyone that knows us four people, they know it was three versus one, because Derek's going to side with Oshin no matter what. <laughs> I knew this straight off the bat, right? But also, if you know them people, you'll know if Oshin and Shane are winning, they're the most arrogant people you could possibly come across, and they'll try and get in your head. So... We were, I think we were maybe two down on the ninth, and I was in the fairway, and Ross oh. Nally was on the um, on the fairway beside us, and he was chatting away. And this was only afterwards they come back to me and said, "Oh, you were cheating!" I, I could tell you here on air, hand on heart, I did not cheat on the ninth hole. It was the sixteenth hole, <laughs> <laughs> and the only reason I cheated was because we needed to win the next hole to have any chance of drawing the golf competition with the two lads they were smug as anything it was driving me insane and sometimes you got to do what you got to do that's no, simple no, as uh, look the man's just after cop into cheating and golf um <laughs> i don't think anyone will ever trust craig lynch again after that look um, carl when you're on the side of the smugness of shane and you <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do <laughs> and on that bombshell uh, Oshin, like I said, thanks a million for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I really enjoyed the chat, um, and, and hopefully you did, and, and found it nice and relaxing. Um, it's great to hear some of the things that that I've I've never heard you speak about before. Um, so again, uh, thanks a million, and we'll hopefully see each other uh, for a game of five aside or, or around the golf soon. <laughs> All the percent, lads. Thanks very much. Enjoyed the chat. Good stuff, yeah, guys. Well done. All the best. And that has been episode three with Ushi McConville.
thank you again for tuning in and just let me give you a little reminder to subscribe to our podcast channels on apple podcast and spotify and don't forget to give us a little subscribe on youtube also thank you very much see you again